Right up. more thrilled to see <laughs> to see it come because things are getting tough in this world we're we're due for a reset you know what we need a reset and jesus is going to make things right again and everything's going to be great he's so cool okay revelation 22 12 and these are these are red letter words of the king in these next two verses and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to, according as his work shall be. See, now, let's look at, uh, I want to show you a scripture here. Look, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, real quick, in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let's look at where, verses 14 and 15. So if you're thinking, oh man, you know, I don't really have any works. Yeah, you do. You just don't know. You just can't think of them now. God's used you for all kinds of things in your life to do good to others. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Okay? You're still going to be saved if you are born with the temple of God inside you, even if you don't have any good works. But uh, hopefully you do. You have some. You may not know uh, about them, but you do have some. Okay? And... Even if you don't have many, that is not going to send you to hell. It's not works that save you. It's the blood of Jesus, his mercy, his kindness, his generosity. He's just really good is why we are saved. We have done absolutely nothing to warrant salvation. Nothing except be born as one of his. Okay. But wonderfully that's all it takes is for you to be born as one of his he died for his he said my sheep hear my voice and they and they follow me well you have to be his sheep already to follow him when you hear his voice don't you so he died for all of his sheep all over the world he already died for us we're already saved maybe you think well then why then why are we commanded to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Because the children of God who are saved by the sacrifice all over the world are in captivity. They're in the captivity of every false religion around the world. And because they are in captivity, he wants us to go into all the world with the message. So by his word and by the power of his spirit, as they hear his word, he can draw them out of that captivity into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So that's why he sends us into all the world because his children he died for already are, uh, are everywhere. This is a wheat field, not a tear field. 
This is a wheat field God planted. Let's look at Matthew 13, 38. Real quick. Go in your Bible. If you have your Bible, it's good to get to where you can navigate your Bible. Matthew 13, 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Now, since when does a seed have any ability to change its genetic structure with a decision? It doesn't happen. Neither can we. We can't change who we are born to be with a decision. Okay, you are born to be what you are born to be. And you just, you don't choose what you're going to be. You figure out what you are. Okay, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked one. It's very cut and dry. Do you think a tear can decide to be a wheat? I don't think that's ever worked for them. It hasn't. Now, uh, it just doesn't work that way. Okay. So if you don't have any works, if you don't feel like you have any good works for God, that doesn't mean you don't because the works that you have that will produce gold and silver and precious stones are only the ones where you were surrendered to him and he was in control within you and he did his works through you as a vessel. That's what you get crowns and rewards for is if he used you as a vessel. Um, you know, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags before him, according to Isaiah. So he says here, my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. In verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end the first and the last. He is the almighty God in a human body contained within perfect immortal flesh. In verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have the right, that they may have right to the tree of life. See, we are going to be able to eat from the tree of life and there will be no death in the Holy city. Nobody dies from the time we're evacuated all the way through when we come back. Nobody dies in the Holy City ever. <laughs> and may enter in through the gates into the city. So see, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now what, what if the only thing you've ever done is love God? Well, you've obeyed the first and most important commandment and you'll be okay. Love God and he will direct you into all the rest. In verse 15, for without, outside is what it's talking about, are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. See, those who are born of just flesh with no temple, they're no different really than animals. They're, um, they're what man is without God. They're just uh, selfish, self-centered, self-survivalist. Uh, they will kill you to take your food if they're hungry. They, uh, you know, they're just animals. They're, they're, they have no higher, higher abilities like compassion and mercy and these things that God has bred into us with his presence inside us. In verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel. He identifies himself right here. I, Jesus, he's, he's saying he's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And he names himself, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. Now let's talk about, he says, and the bright and morning star. Let's talk about those two things real quick. He's the root and the offspring of David. What that means is he is the almighty God who is the root of David. 
but he's also in a human body. He has encased himself in a human body that is genetically descended from David, King David. So Jesus Christ is God incarnate, God in the flesh, God in a human body. Now, his body is very, very different. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but I'll run it by you. The word says that his body was, he, that the Holy One would not be suffered to see corruption. That doesn't just mean he didn't decay after he died. That means he saw no corruption in any form. Now, the sacrifices throughout the Old Testament, when they were offered up on the altar, before then, they were gutted and their entire digestive system was removed because that would defile the sacrifice, okay, for the, in, for the uh, digestive system to remain inside it. So they would gut the sacrifice, take out the digestive system in all of its parts, and then they would put it on the altar. Now, if Jesus had not had a perfect body, they would have gutted him and taken out his digestive system. It would have had to be done to be a perfect sacrifice. He was not gutted. They did not take out his digestive system. Do you know why? Because he had a perfect immortal body, perfect flesh like Adam and Eve before the fall. Be Jesus, his system perfectly processed everything he ate and drank. There were no wastes produced by his body in any way, shape, or form ever. His body produced no wastes from the time he was a baby in a diaper. He didn't require a diaper. <laughs> his body perfectly processed everything he ingested. So there was no waste produced by his body. He never stank. He never sweated toxins. He sweat blood. He never had any kind of corruption. His ears, his corners of his eyes, and his nose, between his toes, any corruption whatsoever that we disgusting biological creatures have, he did not have. Not any corruption in any way, shape, or form. Now notice, Jesus' blood, it says the life is in the blood. That's why we're, we're not permitted to ingest the blood of any creature. Okay, we're not supposed to do that. The life is in the blood. And his life and his perfect blood, sinless, perfect, untainted, immortal. See, the wages of sin is death. He had no sin, so he couldn't even die. He could not die until that moment when he was hanging on the cross and the, the sins of the world were laid upon him then he was finally able to die and gave up the ghost. He could not die. It was impossible for him to die until the sin of the world was laid upon him. And he was the perfect sacrifice, acceptable unto God. He was a perfect biological specimen to where he, his genetic makeup, he had 23 chromosomes from his mother and one Y from his father to make him male and to give him life. And when his blood was tested in his Israeli laboratory, and they did find it, they did find his blood because directly below the crucifixion site, 20 feet below, they found the Ark of the Covenant with his blood on the mercy seat. And some of his blood that came down through the rock, they scraped it off and took it to a lab and tested it. They said, first of all, whoever's blood that is has only one human parent. Second of all, 24 chromosomes rather than 46 like all of us. And his blood was still alive. Still alive. After 2,000 years, his blood was still alive. He was not like us biologically. He looked like us, but he was perfect like Adam and Eve. Not under the curse like us. See, for him to be able to contain the actual presence of the almighty invisible father within him. 
He had to have a perfect body. Perfect. That expelled no waste. That had no corruption of any kind. Okay? He's very, very special. He's not like us. If people really understood how how really special he is, uh, it would be so much easier to understand how things really are. He's, he's amazing. He's the root and offspring of David, and he is the bright and morning star. Now, Lucifer was called son of the morning, which indicates to you that Jesus created Lucifer. Okay? <laughs> And Jesus created Lucifer in the first place. They are not brothers. They are not equals. You know, I know some false religions out there, like Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, those are cults, by the way. Uh, they both believe that Jesus and Satan are like brothers, both created beings. Well, Jesus Christ is not a created being. His body is the first thing that was created, the firstborn of creation. But... Uh, he is not like the rest of us. He's He looks human, but he's not. Um, his body is very, very special. And he gave that eternal body, eternal life on the cross so we could have immortal bodies to, to give us his eternal life. And he took our death. So he's... He's so he's so amazing. We're going to meet him. We're going to get to see him. We're going to get to see him with his crown on his head. I'm so excited. In verse 17 of Revelation chapter 22, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. If in your heart you're saying, Come, Lord Jesus, that is the Spirit within you that is saying, Come, come. And the bride, okay? What he's talking about with the bride is the is the city with the church inside okay so all of those who are inside the city arrayed in fine linen are contained here he's saying the spirit and the bride say come come the spirit in you does it say come or are you like oh i hope he doesn't come for a while oh i need to do this need to do that uh, no, come. That's what we need to do. We need to be saying, come, Lord Jesus, come now. Remember, I gave you the scripture. It says the spirit truly is ready. You may not believe you're ready, but you are. If he comes for you in death, you're ready. And that's not something that, that you even have to be conscious of, that you're ready. You are ready. Your spirit is ready at all times because the temple is in you. Jesus is in you. God dwells in you. And so you are always ready. Um, let him that is a thirst come. Or it says, let him that heareth say come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. It is being God's friend important to you? Do you want to be reconciled to God? Do you want to... Uh, not be his enemy, well, then you're a child of God and you're born with the temple inside you and you're already saved. And all it takes for you to reconcile to God is just submit yourself to his authority, understand that he's in charge, submit yourself to his authority and just say, thank you, Lord, for dying for me. Thank you. Thank you. That's what he's done. He's done that for you and handed it to you as a gift. And he didn't require anything from you conditionally it's not a conditional thing it's unconditional so be thankful because he has it is the goodness of god that leads us to repentance not repentance that leads us to the goodness of god okay in verse 18 of revelation chapter 22 for i testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book if any man shall add unto these things god shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book you do not ever add. This is mostly for translators. Um, you don't add to the word of God. Okay. Uh, and I can give you an example of things that have been added. Traditions of men. Many in the wicked church teach traditions of men as though it was the word. 
And you know what? They still do that. There's an example of when Jesus was here. He went to a man who was at the pool of, of, um, of Silo. And he asked him, do you want to, he said, pick up your mat and walk and go home. He healed him. The man did what Jesus said, picked up his mat and was going home. And one of the religious leaders stopped him and said, hey, it is not lawful for you to carry your mat on the Sabbath day. Well, yeah, it was lawful or Jesus wouldn't have told him to do it. See, that not being lawful is a tradition of men. It's not the word. That's not the word of God. Jesus would not have told him to violate the word, but he told him, pick up your mat and go home. So that's a tradition of men, which they said, oh, no, you can't do that. Well, yeah, Jesus told him to, which means you can. Okay. It means they were not interpreting. They were adding to the word. Because their tradition, they were considering it equal to the scripture. And they said, it's not lawful for you to do that. But that is not true. Because if Jesus told him to do it, it's not unlawful. Jesus would never tell somebody to do something that is unlawful. So that means the guy was wrong. That means that's a tradition of men that was added to the word of God. You don't add to the word of God. And tradi many traditions of men have crept in there. Just like uh, maybe you didn't know, there is not a single scripture in the entire word of God that tells us that we should not give dates if we can find them. Not a single one. But there are many scriptures that tell us to share what we learn. What I teach you in secret, shout upon the housetops. We have to share what we learn. And if we have dates, I think it's fun to check them out as possibilities. And look at the evidence and see what they offer. But see, that's something that's been added. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that think that date setting is forbidden in the word. Well, no, it's not either. There's not a single scripture in the entire word that forbids it or says you shouldn't or anything like that. But there are a lot of scriptures that say, watch and pray, watch, watch for, uh, it says unto uh, unto you all, I command you to watch in Mark. It's a command to watch. So uh, that's a couple of examples there of things that are added. Straight up.